Well, thank you all for coming, and I'm so glad to see you here, and I wish I could have a chance to meet you all, because it's been a long time since I've been in the OR here uh, to help with you. Well, on October 7th, I presented to the Yale University Anesthesia Department a version of a revision of my annual third year residence lecture talk on altitude physiology and pathology. I'm delighted to be able to give that talk to you this after my colleagues this time of day instead of at 6.45 a.m., which is when I was scheduled. Well, there isn't too much about ancient relevant history of altitude sickness. The first note was written in 32 BC. A Chinese official named Tu Kin wrote of headache while climbing over the mountains to get to India. 1,600 years later, in Peru, a Spanish priest, Jose Acosta, wrote about experiencing severe headaches and vomiting while climbing the Andes to get over to Cusco. The cause was not understood until 1875. In 1875, trying to outdo a British balloon team record, three French balloonists ascended in the balloon called Zenith. Uh, and they went up above 8,500 meters, probably by mistake. <laughs> French physiologist Paul Baer had given each of them a 300 liter goat skin bag with about 65% oxygen in the bag. Each of them had one. He told them to breathe it when they got short of breath. However, they weren't short of breath. They just were euphoric from hypoxia and they failed to breathe the oxygen until they lost consciousness and two of them died. The third one Gaston Tissandier was remembered, was able to begin the descent during which he then woke up, lived to write up the story and provide this sketch of what was going on as he remembered it just before passing out at the highest uh, altitude that they got to. And nobody really knows what that was. So in 1875, Paul Baer published a book, La Pression Barometrique. He was the first scientist to proclaim that the important effect of altitude is the reduced partial pressure of oxygen in the air, and therefore in the blood. This huge compilation of his studies includes this sketch of the balloon trip. The book began Modern Respiratory Physiology when it was published, and Barrett uh, became the French government's health minister, and in 1883, he was sent to French Indochina, which we now call Vietnam, to organize the health service there and he died of dysentery within a few months after, at age 53, after he got there. In 1943, this huge book was translated into English by Fred Hitchcock and his wife Mary Alice at Ohio State University. And you can actually get the whole thing free online now. Well, the widely published tragedy of the Zenith led Italian physiologist Angelo Mosso to build an observatory <clears throat> with a physiology laboratory on Monte Rosa on the Swiss-Italian border at about 55-59 meters altitude. His plan was to prove that altitude sickness was due to acapnea we call it hypocapnia, low CO2, from hyperventilation. 
When it was finished in 1883, the Italian queen, Margarita, at age 43, climbed the 1,300 meters that you had to climb from the top of the cable car to get to the hut <coughs> in her honor. The place was named and is still called the Capana Margarita. Maso's thesis was soon disproved by Haldane <coughs> from Oxford, but his lab um, has been a center for altitude research ever since, especially the res regulation of respiration and the patho pathological effects of altitude hypoxia. This picture of the lab is a recent version. The thing has to, had to be rebuilt in the late 19, uh, 20th century, and it now has 70 beds and good dining facilities for people who are going to do their research there. Well, in World War I, high altitude aviation crashes, crashes were reported, probably due to the pilots flying too high. This was soon realized to be due to the hypoxic loss of consciousness. So this led to efforts, not only to having oxygen to breathe, but also to detect and continuously measure the arterial blood saturation <coughs> without <coughs> uh, actually Ludwig Nikolai, <coughs> a professor of physiology in Göttingen, built this first in vivo blood oxygen saturation meter in 1932. But of course, it couldn't be flown in an airplane. In the late 1930s, an ear oximeter was developed by Glenn Milliken, working in Cambridge, hoping to pro protect pilots flying too high. He returned to the US as World War II neared and he got his design made in Minneapolis. But the tiny photocell currents needed a galvanometer, which is a very unstable device. It has to be mounted very on sponges, so it couldn't be used in an aircraft, and it was never flown. Just a year or two later, in London, John Squire realized that if the red and infrared light passing through a tissue was measured, quantitated, before and after blanching the tissue with a pneumatic compressor, the ratio of the ratio of the four numbers, the logarithm of those four numbers, is enough to calculate the saturation. And they thought for many years that the saturation that they would get would be arterial. Unfortunately, there's a lot of venous blood that got squeezed out too. So what they were measuring was a mixture of venous and arterial blood when they compressed it out of the tissue. And that wasn't really recognized for a long time. It was Squire's discovery that was used by Takuo Aoyagi, who invented the pulse oximeter 35 years later. And he is one we now call the inventor. He realized that only arterial blood was pulsing uh, with arterial pulses, and therefore he could use the arterial pulses to actually use the four numbers of the red, red and infrared and bottom of the pulse and top of the pulse to calculate the saturation. And that's why the pulse oximeters don't need to be calibrated. They actually make that calculation <clears throat> with every beat. Well, now we go back to physiology. In Ghent, Belgium, in 1930, Corneille Hamans, while investigating the role of the carotid sinus in blood pressure regulation, accidentally discovered the 
carotid body chemoreceptors uh, to response to cyanide and then to hypoxia. So he won a Nobel Prize in 1938 for that discovery. And since then, thousands of papers have been reported, studies of the carotid body and its role in high altitude respiration. The interaction of the carotid body responses to both oxygen and carbon dioxide is all within the carotid body and it's also very complicated. And that's what I will now discuss. <clears throat> 